Let's begin. We negating contention one is civil war. IMF programs increase the likelihood of civil wars in two ways. First, through coups, as Casper 15 explains, leaders use the distribution of economic rents to maintain the support of regime elites. When countries join IMF programs, they are required to implement reductions in government spending and the restructuring of financial institutions. These reforms can diminish a leader's capacity to redistribute wealth, which increases the risk of a coup. For this reason, Casper 15 explains membership in an IMF program increases a country's probability of a coup attempt by 290%. Second, through inequalities, Forrester 19 explains of IMF programs, the poor are disproportionately vulnerable to cuts in social spending since low-income households depend on government transfers. The fund has repeatedly argued for fewer restrictions on goods and capital flows, for instance, removing protections from unskilled labor-intensive industries, thereby increasing income inequality. This means more war, as the UN 20 explains, inequality in access to resources, public services, and power has been associated with intense grievances that have often been mobilized to fuel violent conflict. All of these scenarios are devastating, as PMC 12 explains, civil, civil wars, revolutions, and coups have killed millions of people. And furthermore, Thine 12 explains, civil violence effects include the flood of refugees, the spread of infectious diseases such as HIV and malaria, and a decline in economic growth. Contention 2 is education. IMF loan programs crushed social spending as HRW 20 explains the IMF has started locking countries into new long-term austerity condition loan programs that have meant devastating cuts in education, wage freezes, and unpaid work burdens. That destroys education as Dowd 17 explains. IMF programs erode the government's capacity to provide tuition free or low cost education. Even those who may get an education will be affected by wage ceilings, which limit the number of teachers leading to reduced teaching quality. That sparks malnutrition as Dow continues. As household education increases, the odds of health deprivation decrease. In the absence of a program, children living in an educated household have a reduced odds of being malnourished by 38%. Malnourishment results in stunted growth and economic harms, as Abdi 16 explains. One in three people worldwide suffer from malnutrition, and 159 million children face stunted growth. Across Africa, malnutrition results in a loss of 11% of GDP, more than the annual losses brought about by the 2008 financial crisis. Contention three is Colombia. The IMF is responsible for the 2016 peace deal in Colombia, as IMF 18 explains. The government carried out ambitious tax reform with help from the International Monetary Fund to strengthen government finances. Without this reform, it would be impossible to make good on the pledges in the peace agreement, said the Deputy Finance Minister of Colombia. In addition, MGIA 16 explains the IMF pledged an $11 billion line of credit specifically for the implementation of the agreement. This agreement has made the situation worse. As Tucker 20 explains, since the peace agreement was signed, things have gotten worse. Indigenous communities suffer frequent attacks due to the lack of protection from authorities. The peace deal has left a power vacuum, hurting humanitarian aid groups, as Galois 20 explains. Colombia's peace deal has left a power vacuum for other armed groups to contest territory, making it very difficult for humanitarian groups to do their work. Before the peace deal, aid groups used to negotiate with the local paramilitary to ensure safe passage for their aid supplies. Now we can't do that because we don't know who's in charge. This crisis has meant devastation, as FAO 2019 uh, explains. During 2018, food security, security in Colombia significantly deteriorated, with 4.5 million people severely food insecure. Contention for is tobacco. The tobacco epidemic is getting worse now, as Savandoff 17 explains. Smoking causes more than 5 million deaths each year, 80% in low- and middle-income countries. The number of smokers is still increasing in many countries. The IMF keeps the industry alive in two ways, and the first is privatization. As Gilmore 09 explains, the IMF has promoted the privatization of state-owned tobacco industries as a, as a part of loan conditions. While state-owned companies as monopolies face little incentive to advertise, privatization has been accompanied by mass marketing that aggressively targets young people and women. Smoking rates have markedly increased in countries where privatization has taken place. The second is deregulation. As Gilmore continues, the IMF has also pushed for tobacco tax and tariff reductions. Companies have been able to take advantage, leading to substantial reductions in excise and mark reductions in cigarette prices. The impact is math death, death as Savandov 11 quantifies. Half of all smokers will die to tobacco, and unless tobacco use is severely curtailed, one billion people will die over the course of the century. Let's read again. All right. Do you need any cards or anything? Yeah, Actually, you're this stuff. Stuff. We're good. Yeah. All right. Um, is everyone ready? Oh, okay. yeah, that's good. We affirm contention one is ethnic conflict. Denny and Walter 2014 finds that if a civil war begins, it's more likely to be initiated by ethnic groups than any other type of group. Since 1946, 64% of all civil wars were divided along ethnic lines. IMF reduces ethnic conflict in three ways. First, by pacifying divisions. Soys at 15 finds that IMF interventions lead to great empowerment of excluded groups who might agitate for change during periods of economic crisis. On balance, IMF will pacify ethnic relations in crisis-ridden countries. Second is liberalization. Vladimati 11 finds that free market 
market reforms would raise the respect of human rights by um, by 39%, and Key 14 finds that openness to trade decreases the probability of armed con civil conflict. IMF is an important mechanism through which national economies are integrated into the global economy. Third is decreasing tensions. So as of 15 finds that IMF stabilization measures increase people's wealth, welfare and um, allow governments to buy off opposition from ethnic groups who might be encouraged to mobilize against them. For these three reasons, IMF is very effective in cutting ethnic tensions. As Soyuz of 15 finds that being in an IMF program for more than five, month, uh, five months in a year is associated with an increase of almost 0 0.7 points in ethnic peace. In other words, IMF involvement would cut the level of ethnic tension in a country by half. The impact is twofold. First, conflict deaths. Hanneman in 2005 finds that indeed, since the middle of 20th century, ethnic clashes have led to the death of perhaps 20 million people in countries. And second is economic toll. Ethnic, ethnic conflict destabilizes all econ institutions. As Nairi 11 finds polarization of an ethnic cops always destabilizes all social, political, and economic institutions as it did not allow for the building of cohesive institutions. As Nairi 11 finds that ethnic conflict has been considered the greatest contributor to the slow pace of development globally. And in the situation of warfare, there can never be any meaningful economic growth. Contention two is pandemic recovery recovery. The current economic outlook has been disastrous, which is why the IMF is as important as ever. Klobuchar 20 finds that with widespread lockdowns and business shutdowns spoiling the global economy, over half the world has asked the IMF for a bailout. Currently, the IMF is essential in saving the global economy for two reasons. First, loan servicing. Masters and Chasky 20 finds that the IMF has pushed wealthy countries to suspend its collection of debt owed by low-income countries through the end of the year, which the group of 20 agreed to do. And in total, the fund has also pledged to uh, deploy one quarter of its one trillion in lending capacity. Second, SDR. SDR is the type of global currency that the IMF controls. As Lao 21 explains, that each time the IMF decides to issue a new allocation of SDR, the organization is basically acting as an international central bank. Countries can then buy or sell SDRs depending on their needs. And for example, a country that is suffering economically and needs more liquidity to make payments can sell a portion of their SDRs in exchange for cash. Reuters 21 finds that G20 major economies have agreed to raise international monetary fund um, reserves with a new allocation of funds own SDR currency and a potential boost of uh, lend to poor countries. Additionally, Sonnet 20 finds that Dick Durbin and colleagues have introduced a bill on, oh, that would direct IMF to um, provide $700 billion of SDR for 155 low-income countries. This is critical for pandemic response. As Shalal Lauder 21 finds that an allocation of SDRs at the IMF could enhance liquidity for low-income countries that facilitate their much-needed health and economic recovery efforts. The impact of these two links is twofold. First, economic growth. Feedback in Kostigani 15 finds that receiving IMF assistance increases the annual growth rate of recipient countries by four to seven percent. This will offset the harms of the pandemic as the Financial Times of March 1st finds that the pandemic had brought an end of decades of poverty reductions and between 88 to 150 million people fell back into extreme poverty. Second, debt crisis. Villegas 21 finds that the pandemic is racking up trillions of dollars of debt and the risk is very high for emerging market debt crisis where a lot of countries run into problems at once. Luckily, Belima and Psy 21 finds that an estimate effective IMF supported pro programs corresponds to about one third of the unconditional probability of experiencing a sovereign default. This is critical as Stiglitz and Rashid 20 finds that a global debt crisis today would push millions of people into unemployment and fuel instability and violence across the world. Thus we affirm. You don't need our case, right? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, you good for cross? Yeah. Okay. So on your first or on your second link, you just kind of assert that like a free market increases human rights. Why does liberalization increase human rights? Uh, wait, why, why does it happen? Because like yeah. you have international pressure in your own country. If you're not liberalized, they, they, these countries have no incentive to decrease like human rights abuses. So like when you're like connected to like the whole global economy. There's a lot of pressure in, in order to like continue staying liberalized. Really? like cause human rights. Like, I don't know. Do you think like Europe is that tough on human rights? I mean, like they trade with China a lot, but China's yeah. not that great on human rights. They're pretty bad. Like, I mean, like United, like the U S and like, 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 you, uh, do you think the U S cares about like, human like, rights? Sanctions on like China or put tariffs, right? Like those would go. Yeah. Away but they're still countries have less of an incentive to do human rights. Do you think that the U S cares about like, human rights? Yeah, obviously. Like that's why they go to like all these wars and stuff, right? Like what's like, what I don't do you think they're going to wars to protect human rights. Yeah, that's why they're like putting sanctions on Iran right now. That, I don't think that's, that's why they're doing that either. But all right, can I have a sure. question? Sure. Okay. So for your um for your um link on uh, your first uh, link on education, how how did you get to destroy education to malnutrition? I didn't really get the link. Uh, but because like, there's a lot of ways you can get there, but basically, if 
you don't have an education, it's harder to find high paying jobs, which makes it harder to, to like, get food. If you don't have a high paying job and you're in poverty, yeah, it's harder to get food than if you're rich. Okay. 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 So on your argument about like what's like your first thing about pacifying, like what I don't I don't really catch it. Like what what's the link? So basically when IMF goes to these countries, it puts conditions to empower and give minorities voices. And that like stops the um, like the divisions in the own country because now you're giving like 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 so like be oppressed, like more voice. wait. So like if group A hates group B and group A has all the power and then group A sees group B gets all the power, like do you think group no, A is going to no, be very happy about like that? that right? If group A hates group B, but has all the power, they can do whatever they, they want to group B. But while, now if group B has equivalent power, group A has no way to like, like oppress them and like, like cause like all these ethnic divisions. Sure. Okay. On your like, uh, support, uh like contention for about tobacco, the mm-hmm. whole thing is just, wait, my question is like, do the when IMF goes, do they privatize tobacco companies or like do they like? Privatize well, it's like a state like, owned, it's like the tobacco companies originally are like state owned. Tobacco companies are state owned. I, I thought yeah. like you privatize like water or agriculture, like not like you like, like. I mean, our evidence says they privatize oh, sure. tobacco companies too. Sure. Okay. Do you have a question? Okay. Yeah. So on your second argument, uh, like your contention too about pandemics, you say that like your first impact is economic growth. You say that growth increases by like 4.7% and then we jump to 100 million people getting pulled out of poverty. Um, Why yeah, does growth because, reduce the because, people like, in poverty? Pandemic, the, the pandemic decreased GDP by like 5%. Why did, but why does GDP grow? Why does GDP growth? Oh, okay. Obviously, like that will like take away the negative. I'm just confused why like GDP growth helps people in poverty, but that's fine. Okay. Uh, Henry, do we need prep? Okay. We're All right. Good. If everyone's ready, it's just going to be down their case. Everyone good? All right. Let's start in their first contention about ethnic conflict. A few responses at the top. First, you can turn it because intervention like the IMF can actually increase tensions. Heinz 18 writes that third party intervention can be viewed negatively by those in power as a breach of state sovereignty. This undermines processes of reducing ethnic insecurity, triggering their impact. Second, you can turn it. Loans cause way more war. Caraway 18 writes that governments who borrow from the IMF will make cuts to the public sector, which increases the potential for disruptive protests. And Turna 14 writes that middle classes would support the state if they have benefits such as wage hikes, States are ineffective and tend to be vulnerable to revolution and violence. On their first warrant about pacifying divisions, first, we would say that governments have incentives to pay off ethnic groups themselves absent these reforms. And second, we would argue that their choice to study is short term and the long term. Governments will have to implement austerity and stop paying off ethnic groups. On the second warrant about liberalization, first, turn it liberalized trade increases ethnic conflict. Schiller 16 writes that ethnic conflicts follow shifts in power away from the working class, including globalization, the decline of labor unions and inequality preferred because it's specific to ethnic conflicts. Second, you can turn it. More trade causes resource wars. McLaren 08 writes that civil wars often contest control over some important tradable commodity. Rid of diamonds in recent wars in West Africa and conflicts in El Salvador attributed to coffee shows the link between international trade and civil war. And Cali 15 writes that empirical increases in the price of oil and mineral commodities. 10% raises the risk of conflict by 2.2%. Third, you can turn it again. More trade causes resource dependency. Downey 10 writes that programs imposed by the IMF force nations to maintain high raw materials exports to meet debt obligations. And Khalifa 07 writes that IMF export policy in Russia was so integrated into the economy that it wasn't able to protect itself. Crisis and poverty resulted in 500,000 extra deaths per year. On the third warrant about tensions, first, it's literally the same as the first warrant. Second, you can turn it. IMF policies destroy tax revenues. Routon 11 writes that IMF policies raise interest rates to slow down the economy, making credit less affordable to generate output that deprives higher tax revenues for social spending, which to pay off like ethnic groups. On the first impact of deaths, first, uh, the conflicts we cause cause the same level of death. Second, their study says ethnic conflicts degrees decrease, but not holistic wars decreasing. Moreover, it's short term. It's only analyzing a few months after the crises. On the growth impact, there's no quantification. We say that the economy recovers quickly after the war ends. On the pandemic recovery argument, on the first warrant of servicing. 
First, their evidence concedes that these debt suspensions will only last until the end of the year. Second, international actors have incentives to do forgiveness regardless. Third, turn, they're paying off debt with more debt. Abeto Mahi 21 writes that Africa has become highly in debt to the IMF, and despite increased revenue, debt jumped nearly 150% in 2018, which is why so many countries like Ecuador are defaulting right now. For, fourth, you can turn it. Austerity increases inequality per the link in our first contention, which increases debt. Toslavsky 16 writes that inequality means that the tax base of the state is rather small that diminishes revenues and makes the state dependent on borrowing, which results in more defaults. On the second warrant of SDRs, first turn it. More flexible alternatives to SDRs exist. Muchala 21 writes that SDRs have limitations to their use. The weight of basic votes continues to provide the U.S. with an effective veto on SDR allocations. A reformed system would assign regional mechanisms to an exchange and agreed reserve currency on a regional level to create a more equitable architecture. That's better than the current system where the U.S. might veto it in the future. Second turn it. SDRs are inflationary. She 16 writes that inflation in countries receiving SDR allocations was higher because of effects which encouraged countries to pursue expansionary policies due to the perceived safety of higher reserves. That hurts the poor. As Clement 20 writes that higher inflation hurts the poor because their wages and welfare benefits grow less than the inflation does. Third, you can turn it. SDRs increase predatory Chinese loans. Hill 21 writes that SDRs would go to pay debts to the Chinese government. SDRs would make restructuring loans less likely, giving Beijing the green light to proceed, which increase defaults. On the first impact of growth, first, most growth doesn't go to those poor. Lawson 16 writes that far from trickling down, income and wealth are sucked up by the 1% as, as individuals use their power to get all the money. On the second impact of debt crisis, there are viable alternatives. Kepper 20 writes that often countries simply restructure their debt by extending the debt's due date or devaluing their currency to make products cheaper, which is why they don't need the IMF. Okay. Uh, do you mind sending a speed shot? Yeah, sure. Perfect. Thanks. And then I'll hold off and privatize you. Wait, no, we can technically... Use prep. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, 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 you can. I'm just going to make sure that I don't have anything in there that I didn't read. Sounds good. Perfect. All right. We have to look up for it. Yeah, it should be sent. Yeah. Let me know if there's anything in there I didn't read. Sounds good. Once you get it, let's FaceTime Q. I got it. Uh, I'll call you Samra. Okay, starting prep time now.
Okay, I had one minute and 26 seconds to use a print. Okay. So the, obviously the order is just me from my their case. Okay. <clears throat> Get my timer here. Okay. Is everyone ready? Good. All right. Let's start with frontlining a couple of top level responses they gave. First, they say the intervention increased the attention because it's viewed negatively. You don't have to worry about this because the warrants are because the uh, loans are already taken, the takes out any offense they have. Second, they say that there's cuts to public sectors that causes increased protests. I'll get to that on their side of the flow. It's basically just an extension on their side of the flow. Group every single turn they read on the entirety of our C1. It's all outweighed by our C2 talking about SDRs. Insofar as that you can't solve for any of the current COVID recession right now that uh, that like countries can't do anything, that means that there's absolutely no probability of being able to solve for ethnic conflicts because people always care about the economy before they care about any like inter. Are like inter uh, like racial and inter ethnic divisions. There's no way that you can even begin to solve any of these wars again before you get out of the COVID crisis. That is really critical here. Let's get to respond their responses on it. Firstly, they say that our Evans concedes that it only lasts until a year. They don't implicate why this matters in the round. Uh, sec uh, secondly, they say that like debt there comes with more debt, and, like they're going to default right now. But once again, the IMF is better uh, than like all these other countries. There's a lot lower interest rates than what the other alternatives are. They're way better. Like uh, the, the alternative once again is just defaulting to a debt crisis, which is way worse. So uh, finally, they say there's the, the like austerity increases this basically just like a cross up of their first contention onto the responses on their second contention talk or second sub one talk about C, uh, uh, talking about SDRs. Firstly, they say that like alternatives exist, like the US vetoes. They don't implicate why the US veto is like a uniquely bad thing that doesn't like even connect or uh, response. But second of all, this doesn't even matter because like the US has already said that they're going to allocate it. The G20 is already going to allocate it. It doesn't really matter. Second of all, they say that there's like it's inflationary and it occurs uh, like it encourage expansions in the past. The issue is that right now the reserves of these lower income countries is at absolute zero. There's no possibility that becoming inflationary or doing like these massive expansion things like they were talking about with Haiti or for example there's zero reserve right now they need it really badly right now to get out of the pandemic in the first place and then finally they, they talk about like Chinese loans are really bad like they're increasing the issue is that the SDR is solving the problem of Chinese loans because without these Chinese loans these Chinese loans come in and like take ports like in Sri Lanka for example but with SDRs you allow them to pay off uh, Chinese loans are not a problem anymore let's go on to their first intention talk about some more, more specifically on coups uh firstly the non because the IMF is actually shifting away from conditionality to their uh loans right now Smith in 2021 Funds. They need more than 100 programs accrued globally versus $88 million. They are conditionally attached to just three of the credits. But even if you won't, don't buy that, seconds, the IMF central bank conditionality actually increases central bank strength, which limits the fiscal authority's ability to manipulate economic outcomes. Ryan's work in 2020 finds that IMF CBI conditionality is implemented to add checks and balances to limit a government's rule to manipulate economic outcomes. This is critical because dictators inherently seek for their own gain. The only redistribution they do is at minimum possible to retain more power. Most of it is negative. On their link, talk about inequality. Firstly, we prereq because you can't solve inequality without solving other societal inhibitors like the S, uh, like SDR, you can't actually like even begin to solve for the uh, problems of poor people if you're in a recession in the first place. But second is even if you don't buy that, Nozaki in 2011 finds that IMF program involvement causes a unique increase in social spending and the effects are particularly strong in lower income countries. This means that empirically we've seen in the past there's been an increase in the spending that means that there's no uh, like inherent de detriment to inequality. But even if you don't buy that, Mariotti in 2017 finds that IMF social spending and taxation actually reduces inequality independently of that because he finds that fiscal policy, especially social spending and taxation, features strongly in IMF programs. On to education. First of, all, first of all, you can cross by Nozaki from above because it tells you uniquely that there's an increase in social spending that caused education too. But second, you can cross by Smith above in response to their human rights watch evidence, which is talking about like the 84 per, or like 84 percent like have new loans. The issue is that their fine print says it's just promoting fiscal consolidation. You always prefer Smith on this because it tells you empirically what is going to happen and what is happening in the status quo. But even if you don't buy that, thirdly, as a turn, is austerity measures are actually good because they restore confidence and create a stronger private sector. Amadeo tells you that austerity measures restore confidence in the borrowed country's budget management. Let's move on to Colombia. China's the alternative to this. Who is way better? Castro Lovers in 2008 finds that China's been funding progress in developing countries. The question is that these funding alternatives have been a lot worse than the IMF. This, uh, and then also, their link just says that the IMF does tax reforms. It doesn't mean that the IMF created this PCL. Finally, on tobacco. Group both warns the internal link is privatization for both. You can cross apply these stuff from above on this. But second, the economics of the tobacco doesn't link into the impact. There's no internal warrant on how tobacco prices uniquely prevents death. The incentive for smokers still exists regardless as far as nicotine is an addictive chemical. But finally, Marlboro, for example, still exist. The main producers of cigarettes is still on the planet. So that means that the impact of this privatization, these small like local uh, companies doesn't really matter. Uh, can we get can the we speech doc? Yes, yeah, speech yeah. doc as well. Sure. Uh, let me just delete the stuff I didn't read.
OK, it's sent. Um, once we get it, we can start cross. Sounds good. All right, we've got the evidence. So if you want, um, can I ask the first question? Yeah, go for it. Oh, one sec. Yeah, okay. So you say that countries are reserves of like zero right now, right? Yep. Don't SDR allocations go to every IMF country? Yes, but the issue is, is that even if they do go to every IMF country, the amount that is allocated to lower income countries is not only enough for their like uh, needs for liquidity, but it's also proportional to their GDP, which makes right. sense. Right, but like the not every liquidity. country has zero reserves, right? Like yes, some countries say have lots low, of reserves. Yes, but I'd say most lower income countries have zero reserves right, right. now. But like lower, some, lower, some yeah, middle income reserves. countries, right, have like lots of reserves, right? We're not like talking about middle income countries. Like, Right, but the middle income countries still get like lots of reserves, right? Like they get SDRs from an yeah, but, SDR allocation. Yeah, but that's not responsive. We're talking about our right. low income countries. So these right, low but a middle income, income country can still debt default and have people go into poverty, right? Yeah, but it doesn't really matter because we read the only our impact on this is lower income countries. So it doesn't really matter because you. I mean, them. but you like you can still have really bad poverty and social situations like in you middle, income countries, the middle and... income countries. So it doesn't matter. Let's talk more about education, okay. right? So given that empirically the IMS approach into the latest COVID pandemic has been um, less conditioned on austerity and these conditionalities, why does it matter that? you're impacting education or how? I mean, okay, so conditions aren't happening in 2020, but literally every single program or at least 80% of the programs still have conditions embedded in them. They're just going to come back after the crisis is over. That's right? not true. Your evidence just says that it's just like a call for like conditionality that in no way says that there's going to no, be like, conditionality. Like uh, we have evidence that specifically says that they're bringing conditions back after the coronavirus crisis, right? Like where do you read? Like, which evidence are you talking about that's talking about the fact that they don't have conditions in them right yes. now? Yes, I'm talking about your Human Rights Watch evidence that says in the very fine print that uh, I can find this specific part. Um, they contain language promoting fiscal consolidation. That in no way implies okay. that they are going to... Like, like, Language no, no, no. promoting like, fiscal consolidation is like the most okay, but that's like one piece of evidence that we read. We also have other pieces of evidence that indicate that like they are going to continue the austerity programs after like the crisis is over, right? It's the same thing as your evidence that you read, which says that like loan forgiveness is only only going to last till the end of the year, right? Okay, like which the IMS evidence, which can you tell me which evidence in your case says that they're going to do conditionality in the future? Um, like I, it's in like the doc somewhere. Um, yeah, I'm on your doc right now, and there's nothing yeah. other than the Human Rights Watch in terms of uniqueness evidence. Okay. So if like, you want to provide a new I'm one sure. a summary, that's a little abusive, I'd say. I mean, I, like, like it's it would be like a front line to the arguments that you read, right? The conditionality is increasing, like, central bank strength and stuff, like, all of those responses to our C1 and C2, considering that, like, you don't really make the argument that, like, the IMF has, like, reformed conditionality in case. Yes. Well, yeah, that's the point is I make it in rebuttal. Right. So we would read it as a frontline first summary. But yeah, I get, that's fine. So like we have evidence that indicates that most IMF programs in 2020 still have conditions. They're just going to be implemented after the yeah, crisis. And we have evidence that says that that's not true. And your own evidence doesn't indicate that that's true. So that's time. I mean, but we will read evidence as a frontline to all of the things that you just read in rebuttal. That's fine. We'll start running prep now.
All right, stop prep. That was a minute of. We have a minute of seven left. Uh, Neg Wayneaf, is everyone ready? Okay. On our first contention, we agree dictators only redistribute enough to remain in power. That gets us gets us out of like the central bank turn. They say that social spending uh, is increasing, but what Ambrose Twenty tells you is that conditionality is hidden now. But for the for the vast majority of projects, it's re austerity is returning after the pandemic is over, which means even if austerity isn't happening now, it's happening after the pandemic. Then on C two, they say there's like an increase in social spending. No, there's not. Long term, there's more austerity, and then they say that like IMF programs restore confidence. There's no quantification as to what this means at all. Go for our third contention about Colombia. Extend the IMF evidence just says that the government did a deal through the IMF. The IMF like raised government resin revenue through like tax reform uh, to allow the Colombia to meet the uh, conditions of the peace deal. That's why our evidence says that the only reason they were able to make this peace deal is through the IMF. The, uh, the Gilloy evidence says that things have gotten worse because instead of FARC and Colombia fighting each other, it's a bunch of smaller rebel groups fighting the government, which are much more disorganized and don't work with aid agencies. That's the Gilloy evidence, which has caused 4.5 million people to be food insecure. They say with this Kester evidence that China's funding projects in the developing world not talking about colombia at all not only that it's about it's about it's from 2008 and it's talking about energy projects if china wanted to fund the peace deal they would have done it in 2008 right before the imf did it in 2016 the important thing is that the only way the peace deal went through is because there was a restructuring of financial institutions that allowed colombia to have the money to pay things like reparations to indigenous groups which was a condition in the loan they say that the imf didn't create the deal they only did tax reform that's exactly our argument the only way to meet the conditions of the peace deal is through tax reform that's what the evidence says prefer our contention a case over there is because specific country analysis is way better on probability there are millions of things affecting debt defaults in the like entire world like technological advances uh, global interest rates global trade whereas with colombia we can specifically isolate before and after because there's like less global macroeconomic factors that factor in which is why we're better on probability we're going to their side now on their contention one, they made a really bad decision conceding all the turns. You can extend the Schiller evidence, which says that ethnic conflict follows the trends of globalization. The IMF is responsible for globalization and the reduction in trade barriers, which is reducing the power of labor unions because multinational corporations look for the cheapest labor possible. What this does is it means we get access to not only their 20 million as a result of ethnic conflicts impact, we get we get access to their prerequisite argument that um, ethnic like ethnic conflict destroys infrastructure and like slows growth, which means they probably don't win anything on C2 since they conceded this Turn. They say that you can't solve for ethnic conflict and COVID at the same time. We can be in a war and economic decline at the same time. If anything, economic decline probably makes war more likely because there's like more tension and people are more desperate for power. The other thing you can extend is the conceded resource extraction disadvantage, which says from Downey, which says that the IMF forces countries to have uh, extraction dependent economies in order to meet export requirements. The Russia example goes conceded that this left Russia unable to protect themselves because they were so integrated into the global economy, leading to 500,000 people dying every single year. On their second contention about pandemic, they made a big response not responding to the Kepler uh, impact of evidence, which is that you, uh, countries can restructure on their own by just extending the de deadline or by devaluing their currency, which means it all gets solved by not the IMF getting involved. It was literally conceded. Wait, was that whole response, um, the last response out of time? Uh, no, it was in time for me. Oh, wait, wait, what was it? Sorry, I didn't catch uh, it. Kepler says that countries can restructure by extending debt deadlines or by devaluing their own currency. So like you don't need the IMF. Okay. All right, uh, I'm gonna call Sam right and we'll start prep. Yeah. All right, starting time now.
All right, um, I'm gonna go our case, then their case. Okay. Wait, a uh, quick thing, Summer, where are you gonna do the Wayne? Um, right after our case. Okay. Um, okay. Oh wait, actually, I'm just gonna use a little more prep time. Okay, is everyone ready? Okay. We're going to win on our second sub point on SDR on our first, a second contention. We tell you that global currency, IMF creates a global currency called SDR, where they're putting $700 billion to low income um, uh, liquidity, which is our latter evidence tells you it's going to be enough to do a full health and economic recovery act, um, um, action. And that's going to increase GDP by 7% and decrease the chance of default by one on two, only one third it is right now, saving millions of people from going into poverty. They give you only one response to this oh, whole thing about, it's called about, about like debt restructuring, but there's two problems. First, like we would say, like in a COVID pandemic, like there's a lot of countries who are like in a lot of debt. This debt restructuring really isn't happening. And second, SDR is not even about debt. It's about giving liquidity of cash to these low income countries. We get, st get straight offense on SDR because there's no mitigation on this. We're going to weigh this on two reasons. First, on a prerequisite, because you need to solve um, the SDR and solving the pandemic first, because uh, when you solve for the pandemic, um, you're going to de um, decrease, like um, poverty will be able to be mitigated and austerity um, conditions are still happening. The second prerequisite is that you need to solve for economic growth to do any of their um, problems in the future. Like if you want to increase funding for education or increase funding for like Colombia or like um, um like stop um, wars, you need to actually have economic stuff. They try to link into the turn by saying that our weighing on short term, long term doesn't really make sense because war can happen in a pandemic. But we would say that war is really, really mitigated in pandemic because these countries don't have enough money to sustain a war. That's really important because that means these wars are really, really, um, really, really not that important. So we still we still access our prerequisite onto their case a huge problem they like on they go for Colombia but they drop a turn completely on austerity we tell you that in the status quo like um austerity is actually going to be good because in in the long term what actually ha happens is that you're going to have to be able to do like um, infrastructure and education like reform but if you don't have austerity these countries just blow up with their cash and they're never actually able to have any long-term planning or any money in the future because they they're wasting their money this is really important because that means this this like this Colombia thing would have happened in either world. The second turn on the link we have is this China thing. Our evidence tells you that China is going to Latin America and was, was going to be a substitute for the IMF, but the IMF was there. That's really important because that means that their impact would have happened no matter what, because China would have just filled them with the IMF if the IMF actually didn't exist. That means that in both worlds, this Colombia thing is going to happen in uh, either world. Then they talk about how specific country analysis is really, really important. But we would say that we, we're also talking about specific countries because SDR gives it to a lot of low income countries. And um, um, so we're actually um, still impacting to a lot of low um, developing countries. On, prob on the probability analysis, we would say that on magnitude, you should still prioritize us because we're talking about uh, like a whole, like a holistic analysis. Then also their whole thing about austerity is not unique. There's only three out of a hundred um, like, uh, like um, SDR loans are actually having any like conditions or austerity measures at all. They say that in the future there is going to be, but that's not really responsive to the Smith evidence, which is from 2021 that finds that I if it's like completely on changing a strategy so they're not going to put any austerity measures or conditions on anything okay ready for grand uh yeah we're good okay, you know the uh, first okay. Question. yeah so you say that your evidence says like china is a substitute for the imf right yeah. yes uh can we read what your evidence actually says it says yeah, that china has been funding projects mainly energy related so can you tell me how this at all relates to the colombian peace deal which required a reformation of the country's tax system wait, wait. yeah so sorry you can sorry, go. do you want to go no, you can go. You okay. Can. So the issue there is it's not just the taxes and that you're talking about that purely contribute to the peace deal. The more critical part of your evidence that needs the, that's talking about the peace deal is subsidies. And China can also provide what? that, right? <laughs> Our evidence does not say anything about subsidies. Also, How does subsidies have anything to do with the Colombian also, peace agreement? Also the thing is, also, it's just a mainly like energy, but it's yeah, like it doesn't say anything about Colombia. Like, literally, Colombia yeah, isn't mentioned. Also, at does all. China even have like the capabilities or authority to change Colombia's tax policy? Yeah. Like, 
It also, doesn't matter about the tax policy. The the critical it. part of the turn is that it's saying that China's influence would be there without the IMF. It's not that's, talking about like the that's necessary. Not what it says, that, that's piece. not what it says also, at all. In, in addition, the peace sense. agreement was put in place in 2016. The IMF didn't get involved in Colombia until 2016. I mean, Your evidence is from 2008. So far as like the austerity turn is dropped, where like not we dropped. Say, like we would say like um austerity would okay. be good. It wasn't this dropped at all. Other, also, this is the other thing that I'm confused about. Like you're saying that like most programs don't have austerity and then you're saying austerity good right like yeah those are two arguments you yeah, made sure. in summary but, like it's not like a double bind you can like accept one and it still helps their side okay wait where did you read the austerity like isn't happening evidence um in in the top or smith evidence that tells you 13 out of 100 like right now right but like in response to what um, in response to your response about like how austerity is going to happen in the future, okay, okay. but it's not happening right now. All right. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Uh, do you have a question? So, yeah. go for it. so if you're in like an economic crisis, how are you able to like decrease like chances of war? What? Like if you're, if you're in, in an, an, if you're in an economic crisis, right. like doesn't that mean like war, like, like how, how are you able actually to fund a war? What? God, they redistribute wealth. Like some of the worst wars like, in history have happened during times of economic decline. Like this is a very, this is all very new analysis and second summary. Like Germany had intense hyperinflation and then went on to fight like the biggest like, war in history. The Great Depression. Yeah. Like what? You, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Like a recession doesn't turn a country's yeah, budget to zero. Like, to, like actually go into war. How are you ever going to go into war? And even if you were we able fought to, in the Middle East during 2008 global recession. Yeah, but it was like severely mitigated from 2005 and 2006. The a point million is people. if you're in like an economic crisis, the amount of war you can do is way less. I think the most important thing is you conceded the turn. You made a lot of new analysis and second summary. And the idea that you can't fight a war in a recession is just like very I had to respond to what you said in first summary, right? Okay. Uh, we got a minute 10 left in prep. We're going to run that now. Henry, you're unmuted. Oh, wait up. Okay, it's going to be the neg, then case weighing, and then the off. Is everyone ready? Okay. At the top of our case, they make this austerity good turn about how you can do education reforms. First, they extend their own argument that most programs don't even have austerity, which is an easy double bind that takes out the term. But second, the warrant as to why austerity increases government revenues was literally nowhere in summary, so you can't vote off of it. On Columbia, extend the link. IMF finds that the IMF evidence finds that tax reform gathered money to make good on the pledges in the 2016 peace agreement, such as creating programs for the rebel groups. And the Galuli evidence finds that since the agreement, violence has actually increased because they are more extreme and less organized groups that filled in for the original rebel group that don't work with aid agencies and have increased violence because they're more extreme. The FAO finds that this has left 4.4 million people without food. They, Their only argument to this is that China is going to somehow solve. First, the evidence is not talking about Colombia whatsoever. Our evidence is very specific to Colombia and says that it would be literally impossible without the IMF. Second, this evidence is from 2008 and talking about energy projects. China doesn't have the authority or expertise to change in the entire economic system of the Colombian government, which is only what the IMF could do on weighing. 
they say that they outweigh on magnitude because it's a quote holistic analysis. Our case is a holistic analysis as well. And they've also conceived the specific country analysis that says that it's far more probable because it's far less difficult to, to ana analyze than accounting for every global institution, and global trade flow than like their super broad impact. They say that they solve for growth before that you need to solve for growth before solving Colombia. No, the peace deal in Colombia was already signed. The bad impacts have literally already happened on their F. You can extend the resource dependency turn. It literally went straight conceded. The Downey evidence finds that the IMF forced export requirements because these countries need to pay off their debt obligations, causing massive dependency on raw resources, leaving countries more vulnerable to economic shocks. And in Russia, that led to 500,000 additional deaths per year, which literally outweighs their case on magnitude. It was clean conceded in the last speech, but on the SDR's argument. You can extend the Kepler evidence, which finds that countries can solve their own debt issues themselves by extending the debt arguments and deflating their currency. They make two new responses. They say COVID had lots of debt. No, we would say that we would say that that's like an extenuating case in a recession. In most cases, they could pay it off. And then they say it's more about liquidity. The reason it's about liquidity is to pay off debts. We're still accessing their impact. Okay, I think I have like five seconds left to prep, so I'm going to take that right now. So the order is going to be SDR is weighing their case. Is everyone ready? Good. Okay. Let's start the link extension. Lee, I'll tell you that right now the IMF is allocating SDRs for to a ton of low income countries in order for uh, in order for liquidity. Reuters tells you that that's six hundred billion dollars that's going to these low income countries, which will ultimately get them out of the recession and prevent a debt crisis. That debt crisis could be really bad because it could push millions and millions of people into poverty. Let's evaluate the weighing now. They give you this two pieces of weighing. First, they say they're like, oh, they're doing specific analysis or uh, specific country analysis, and number two, they say uh, like, oh, like their in their impact has already happened. Number one, on a specific country analysis, they don't give you a unique reason why we aren't talking about specific countries we're talking a, bun a bunch about a bunch of different like lower income uh countries they say like oh there's a bunch of like broad macroeconomic factors there really isn't there's literally just allowing the liquidity that goes to these countries there's no like broad macroeconomic factors that they try and tell you that could mess this weighing up but second of all they say that their impacts have already happened the issue is that food insecurity doesn't just like happen one day and then magically go away food insecurity is still happening in colombia right now which means that our prereq still applies over here so let's go that to that right now ultimately when you're in the COVID recession right now you can't solve for any of their impacts on the flow. Please, number one, the impact off of Colombia is talking about food insecurity. You can't even begin to redistribute food insecurity to these people in Colombia. If you're in a recession, you're focused about other broader things. But second of all, they talk about how like, oh, there's ethnic conflict in Russia. But once again, you can't fully solve the issues that are, or, uh, you can't fully solve the conflict that is happening in Russia if you don't solve for the economic, uh, like uh, economic underpinnings that exist in the first place. Once again, they say that we conceded, but they concede the weighing that we did in the first place, which means that even if you don't buy the weighing, you have to, because it's completely conceded. Ultimately, with the, uh, and then finally, on Colombia, this whole China thing gets really messy. What's really critical about it to understand is it tells you that China would have just come in and done the same thing that the IMF did. They say, oh, China could do this. It clearly could. The, uh, the energy investments is proof of it. Fundamentally, what this one comes down to is if the app has even the slightest chance of voting for the prereq way, that means that you vote on our side because it's completely clean. They don't adequately respond to it. This is a clean app ballot. Good round, y'all. Yep, good round. round. Give me Thanks a sec. Take yeah, good round. Thanks for judging.
Uh, Lake Phil, which one is the first speaker? Sorry. Uh, Gus Gerlach is first speaker. Hi, everyone. Okay, um, I voted con on the Columbia argument. To start with the Wang, um, I buy this like per particular like country analysis. I don't think the AFS responses are like coherent slash applicable. Like, um, uh, like this isn't like, explicitly articulated in round, for example, but like you guys are impacting on your SDRs argument, right? To this like broad idea of like massive debt defaults across like multiple countries. Like they're not explicitly applying the logic, but their weighing tells me like, there's like this debt crisis probably has like a bunch of different macroeconomic factors that are gonna indicate whether or not like the number of countries that go into a debt default. Like, I don't really know the whole picture of what's going on there. I do know that in Colombia right now, what like four and a half million people are like in food insecure because this peace deal has created insecure conditions. I think this that the, the prerequisite weighing that you go for also does not uh, is not a prerequisite to the Columbia argument because like their argument is just that like right now there is a harm that the IMF has causing. I don't understand like I'm I'm it's very unclear to me throughout the round how like your prerequisite argument functions in regards to that. Like it's just like here's a harm of the IMF like it's bad. Uh, I don't understand, like their, their argument is not that you like get rid of the IMF and fix it or something like that. Um, so yeah, so like just for me on the wing, like Columbia sort of like comes through pretty cleanly. Um, the, the SDR stuff, like there's there's probably some offense. I do think that you guys like drop this resource extraction turn. So like, I, it's like sort of like wishy-washy, blah, blah. Like, I don't really know which way the econ debate goes on a broad level, but I feel pretty comfortable loading off a pretty clean narrative on this Columbia argument. Um, I think this like general lack of a narrative, Blake, really hurts you in this round. Like, I feel like a lot of arguments are really being just sort of like thrown at me at like random places. Um, like it gets a little bit better in the back half, but I just generally felt like a, it, things were like, I, I, especially in summer, I was really like struggling to like keep track of like a, like a, a flow of like some sort of broad argument that I felt like I was voting for. Um, it just felt like a lot of like spitter spatter like stuff. Um, Lakeville, um, I think, one thing for y'all is like I feel like you guys are spending too much time in some places in this debate like the China response I feel like it's kind of like over and done with like after whenever you guys respond to it the first time like I like just based off like the way that you're saying what this evidence says in round like it's clear that it doesn't really seem to apply um so I just feel like being a little bit more selective about like where you're spending your time in the round could also help you um cool that's it for me I think any questions yeah no that makes sense um yeah thank you Yep. Good luck for the rest of the tournament. Yeah, good luck, guys. Thanks for judging. Good luck. Good luck. Thanks for judging.